Uh, so the last speaker of this morning, or this first session, is Stuart Welsh. Stuart studied fine art and design from 1963 to 1969. He worked as an artist, animator, and teacher before starting Atlantis Paper Company in 1977, which also ran one of the first contemporary art galleries in East London. In 1985, he founded conservation suppliers Atlantis France, now Conservation by Design France. In 1992, he established Conservation by Design Limited. He, was a broad knowledge, he has a broad knowledge of Western and Eastern paper making. In joining a long collaboration with conservation professionals, he has innovated many familiar products, materials, and equipment for conservation and storage. In 1997, following his interest in anoxic storage, he invented squelch drying, which uses vacuum packing to dry wet books. The technique proved very successful following floods in Cambridge, Prague, Egypt, and Japan, where it proved especially good at removing sea salt from the paper. It was recommended by Christopher Clarkson for drying the book in the book. Stuart retired from conservation by design in 2019 to work as a consultant and give more time to his artwork. For the volume, he offered a, special, a personal piece on Christopher Clarkson and teaching for conservation staff training in, no, sorry, Stuart. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a privilege to be here and to present some thoughts on Chris. Um, we probably, when I first met Chris, we, we had a, an immediate affinity because we both went to art school at a very young age. I think Chris was 13 when he went to Camberwell and I was 15 when I went to art school at Derby. Um, my role with Chris was very much a facilitator. And at the time when I was starting in business, uh, looking for products, uh, having started to sell acid-free uh, paper to artists and uh, mountboards, uh, I, I came along to visit Chris at the Bodleian in the bindery. And uh, he immediately knew what he, that he was looking for things. He was looking for we discussed the quality of the board that he was using for the boxing program, uh, uh, amongst other things. So uh, I was inspired to try and go out and get what it, what he needed to do his work. And he inspired you to want to help. I mean, it was just like a magnet, really, to, to find the right materials for him. And, and I enjoyed working with the perfectionist, really, which Chris was. But, he was also so broad thinking and his program of boxing at, at the at Bodley and just made so much sense to protect uh, items when you didn't have the time to physically work on the bindings and to conserve them, uh, but to box, box them and concentrate on the, the most important items. Um, as my work developed and business got uh, more comfortable, I thought it would be interesting uh, to do something with Chris and introduced him to Jack Brazier at the conference in, in Edinburgh and suggested maybe they could do a, a course together, uh, which would, I wasn't sure where it was going to lead. I thought it might give them some pocket money and was able to devote some time with a colleague, uh, Denise, to, to organize in. Uh, the courses for them, and uh, travelled down to uh, to the mill uh, with Chris. I should also say, part of the idea came from a visit to Monte Piscone, where, where Cheryl had set up courses, and I thought something different, but along a similar line, would be possible with Chris and Jack. And so they met, and they liked the idea, and we set, set about it the following year after the conference in Edinburgh. Um, and the journeys that uh, we did backwards and forth for seven years were just some of the uh, nicest times I've ever spent. Uh, Chris was uh, fun to be with, really fun to be with. But he was very serious in, in his intent. So when we arrived at the Mulan, he, he had an idea in his head, which I wasn't expecting how serious it was that this program 
was going to be looking for this uh, cover paper, which I know he's been looking for for a long time, um, and never been able to find the right thing. And I truly didn't understand what he meant about the cover paper, why and what was so special about it, until we started that first course at the Midland Fellowship. Uh, I've got a, a small PowerPoint. I don't know if we can put it on and we can whip through that. Whether it can be done from your end, Alberta. So, can I control the next slide or can we? Probably easier if you just say next and Rhea will do it for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, please. So, this was a photograph I found recently of. Uh, uh, Jacques and uh, Chris and myself at, uh, at the Edinburgh conference in 2006 and uh, when we uh, came up with the idea to, that we should do something. Uh, I'd always wanted Chris and Jack to meet because they were both um, obsessive type of characters really and I, I like obsessive characters and uh, totally different people. I wasn't sure how they'd get on but they <laughs> We thought, well, we'll try it. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, the idea is we would drive down there and we bundled everything into my car at the time. And uh, Chris came over and we, with a huge amount of uh, examples and tools and a heavyweight trunk. And then we had Alan Farrant and Jim Blockton traveling with us from Cambridge and their luggage and then my my gear. Uh, I did take a fishing rod and uh, we set up and we uh, took the ferry over to France and there's Chris on the ferry uh, heading out on a new adventure. Uh, next please. Uh, we stayed one night at overnight stop and uh, then we finished up at the Moulin de Verger and this was the uh, arriving in Jack's yard at the mill. And uh, then we, yes, we can go to the next one if you like. We set up in, in the mill very quickly. Uh, Chris was teaching uh, binding, and the idea was to do the limp paper bindings. And Jack would teach paper making and try to make some cover paper of a grade which Chris uh, would find acceptable. Now, the, Chris had some examples of paper made by Tim Barrett, which was very strong and, and met his requirements in terms of uh, hair strength. Um, but it wasn't, didn't have the aesthetics that he was looking for that he'd seen in those uh, 16th century Italian bindings. Um, Next, please. So I was given the job of uh, setting up a testing for tear strength of, of the paper where we put thread throughs and then added weights uh, using my fishing balances uh, to, to, to give the strength of the, you know, the, the resistance against tear. And that was the, the setup on an old guillotine that we arranged with a weight holding the paper and then threads and the balance at the bottom and we just add weights until it started to tear. Next please. We actually found that the paper that we I thought would, would be working didn't have the strength of the Tim Barrett paper. It was okay but it wasn't and it looked nice but it, it didn't have that strength. As Jacques was busy teaching the class on the paper making, he, he did all sorts of different papers. There was uh, uh, lighter weight papers and the cover papers that he was he's working on. Uh, and he was doing gelatine sizing, which is uh, something I'd encouraged him to do years before. Uh, as an artist, I was committed to the idea you couldn't have a good water full of paper that wasn't gelatine sized. And over the years, he, he really got to grips with it. Uh, next, please. 
And we'll have gelatine sizing a lightweight piece of paper. Um, and next year. Jack had started to, to get linen rags from farmers, and most of it was coming from uh, old tablecloths that the cognac houses and the likes uh, had for when, when the workers were doing the vendage. So they were quite good quality. He also had nightshirts, some beautiful <laughs> nightshirts made out of linen, which were being chopped up. Uh, to make uh, the paper with. And at that time, he only had a Hollander beater, an old uh, 17th century, I guess, Hollander beater, which uh, he worked the, the linen into. And this is showing samples of the rags stuck to the drum at the top and then uh, putting the rags into the beater slowly to, you know, otherwise if it goes in too fast, it'll actually stop the beater and could break it. Um, so, next please. Uh, Chris enjoyed, uh, the, the, you know, it was really nice to see him. He was actually enjoying the teaching, the students were great. Um, and the, it was just easy going, Jack had arranged and Nadine Jack's wife had arranged for um, food to be delivered and prepared for lunch times, and it was always fabulous. Uh, and it was a chance for the two two groups, the paper makers and the book binders, uh, to get together and discuss what they were doing. And in the background of this slide, you can see the uh, the drying loft of the mill, which is uh, the slats for allowing that could be closed or opened as required to let there through the mill. The mill was very old. I mean, it was originally 1539, I think it was started. Um, and uh, I don't think it was originally a paper mill, but it, a few years after it, it became a paper mill, uh, working for the brandy wine trade, working with Dutch merchants. I think that was the uh, input for it. Um, next, please. Uh, this is Chris working and demonstrating uh, in the workshop uh, his models for uh, making the cover paper, the limp paper bindings. Uh, watching him work was, was a privilege, really. It's so precise and so well thought. Um, and I'm sure, you know, just had everybody engrossed, really. Uh, next, please. Go back one. Yeah, so this was uh, in the middle for uh, forming sheet. So uh, I don't know if I think whether this was a cover paper sample or not, I don't know. Uh, you had uh, Andrew Honey and Jane Egan we went down for the first course. Next, please. Uh, after the course was finished, we, we made a, a beeline for buying some cognac. And uh, well, Chris didn't drink that much, he, he certainly enjoyed. Uh, a nice glass of cognac, and we did a number of visits. This, I think the second course we, we did, uh, Jacques arranged a, um, a visit, and we were hosted by uh, La Fontaine de Poyard, which was probably one of the most expensive cognacs you can get your hand on, and it was just delicious, and they gave everybody a little sample bottle and took us around there. Um, vineyards and showed uh, samples of cognac from 1700 that they keep as testing um, to make sure that their standard is the same. Um, so uh, that's Alan Farrant and Jim Blockson there from Cambridge and, uh, uh, and then uh, we moved on from there. So the next, next one please. 
uh, something that we always did really was uh, we started that first year by visiting primarily British uh, World War I uh, cemeteries. And uh, it was, uh, we, we visited numerous ones with Chris and uh, over the years. And this one's at uh, Fleury Chapelle, Fouchy Chapelle. Um, so Chris, you know, had an interest in history. We used to listen to uh, uh, audio tapes on the on the car when we were traveling, and uh, the history of the world in a hundred objects was, I think, the favorite one that, for Chris because it, it had so much uh, interesting information on it. Uh, next one, please. And there we are, I'm ready to cross over uh, back into Blighty again. And, uh, see, my car is just about on it. <laughs> on his, on his up is on that one. Um, did need some new spring putting in eventually. Uh, and we did the course for seven years, I think. And then second year jack had already started building stampers because he felt that that was the only way that you would be able to tell if um paper made on stampers would give a different result to what um uh, was found from using a hollow beater and when we came back for the year that the samplers were working, Chris was just delighted because he said it must have been the, the sound that you heard when the mill was first there, the thumping of the of the samplers in the valley, and uh, it was proved that the samplers really did make a difference to the quality of the really increased, and uh, this is quite satisfying, really. Um, eventually I decided that I got an inkling that Chris wasn't uh, feeling so good that it could, maybe the journey was going to be too hard again the next year. Um, so we give it a rest. And also I think the, uh, we were running out of students of the quality that, that Chris really wanted to teach in that towards the end of that, that last course. And we thought we could give it a rest and then go back and do it another time when uh, Chris was feeling better. But I didn't realize really that was probably things were getting worse and we wouldn't be able to do it again. But Chris was very sad not to do, not to, to be doing the course again. Uh, I think he'd, he'd, he'd formed a real genuine friendship with Jacques and uh, just before Chris died, uh, Jacques came over and I took him over to uh, Stanley Road to, to see Chris. And Chris was really in a bit of his own world at that point, but he looked around and saw Jack and he said, he did, his face just lit up and he just said, oh, Jack, and uh, recognized him straight away. And, uh, uh, I would say I've, I've had a privileged life really to, to work with Chris and his influence products which earned me a living and uh, his determination to, to get things right uh, was something you just had to go with. You, know, you can possibly dream of presenting him with something which wasn't your best effort in terms of quality and giving him what he needed for, uh, for his work in preservation. So I don't know if have I done my time. Um, yes. So that's it. Thank you, sir.